Hey everyone, welcome back to Your Enneagram Coach, the podcast. I'm Adam Breckenridge, joined by my good friend, Brian Lee. Uh, Brian and I get to work together every day to serve our community of certified coaches. And for a few episodes this summer, we are filling in for Beth and Jeff McCord to host the podcast. And we're so glad that you're here. Um, it's our mission here at Your Enneagram Coach to help you see yourselves with astonishing clarity so that you can break free from self-condemnation, fear, and shame by knowing and experiencing the unconditional love, forgiveness, and freedom in Christ. And if you love this content, turn on the automatic downloads, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also share this with someone who would enjoy or benefit from this content too. Well, on this episode, we're going to talk about the Enneagram and emotions. We're going to get into beneath the hood of consciousness and into our emotional world. And our guest and conversation partner for this episode is Phil Herndon. Phil is a licensed counselor. He is the clinical director for the River Tree Counseling Center and Ten Man Ministries, both based out of the Nashville area. He co-wrote the Voice of the Heart Bible study along with Jeff Schulte, uh, which is a complement to the book Voice of the Heart written by Chip Dodd. Phil also spent years serving as a pastor. He is a mentor to so many pastors, coaches, and therapists who are in the caring professions. And personally, Phil is a friend and a mentor to me. He also happens to be an Enneagram nine, which is <laughs> about as good as it gets. Uh, so with that, I want to welcome him to the show. Phil, thanks for being here. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Brian. Good to be here. We were joking before. So we good to meet you. Record that you yeah. and Brian uh, are in sync today with the same with the same kind of shirt. That's right. I was going to say, if you're watching the podcast on YouTube, you get to see uh, Phil and I matching because we got the memo. Mm. Cannot hide style, right, Adam? I mean, right, Brian? That's yeah. right. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> yes. I you love can't. it. <laughs> um, hey, Phil, go ahead, Brian. I was gonna, I was going to start jumping in, but you go first. <laughs> yeah, dude, go for it. Jump in. I, I was just going to say, is there anything else, Phil, that we should know about you? Like, is there any favorite foods, favorite color, TV show? Like, is anything you want to share about about who Phil is? I mean, obviously, fried catfish, favorite food. I mean, that that, that goes without saying. Born in Mississippi, raised in Georgia, educated in Oklahoma. I mean, <laughs> you know that you that was coming. Uh, no, that's really kind of it. I love. I was. I, you know, I'm an old guy now, and I'm doing things I was, you know, never going to do. And one of them was I'm not ever going to become that old sage mentor guy. And now, when you said mentor, I thought, yeah, man, I really love mentoring younger guys. So. I'm just adding that to the list of things I love, but I do sure. I do love this stage of life to be able to do things like this. Love it. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so I have read and loved Voice of the Heart by Chip Dodd because Adam recommended it to me. It's helped me, impacted me tremendously. There may be listeners or viewers out there who have also read it. Um, and as Adam mentioned, you helped co-write the companion to that book, The Voice of the Heart Bible Study. Would you be able to give us kind of some background or some understanding for people who don't know about it or who haven't read it about both of those resources, the book and the workbook and how they work together. Yeah. Love to do that. Um, Chip and I met, I was a graduate student in Grapevine, Texas in 1990. We met, we tell the joke, we met in a psych hospital. We were staff at the psych hospital and, uh, uh, we we were asked to write a Christian based or scripturally based program for the hospital for sexual trauma slash sexual addiction. So people who had both of those things going on at once. And so we got together, it's several of us, but he and I were two other people doing that. We just had had an, a personal affinity for one another and kind of professional. He was way ahead of me in terms of, he was, had been out of school, finished his PhD license. He was actually running, directing a really large practice in Dallas. I was in a fledgling little practice with a former professor of mine over in the Fort Worth side of the Metroplex. And so we kind of that, did that thing where, hey, man, one day it'd be great to work together. And yeah, it sure would. And just a few years later, here, here we are. Uh, he had moved. He's from here. He's actually from Murfreesboro, the town that I'm, that I'm in outside Nashville. And he moved, had moved back home for him to start a treatment program for professional men was kind of the niche and what the affinity was between me and him. And he was certainly the pioneer in this, but it, it hit home for me emotionally and, and even, even logically guys is like, you know, professional men and a lot of people have a lot of intellect 
have a lot of morality. They have a lot of willpower. So they're smart and they're good people and they're tough. But they get in these situations with addiction and unhealthy relationships and those kinds of things. And so real healing mm -hmm. for humans comes at a heart level on this emotional, emotional life that we have. And so that was our connection mm -hmm. beginning. And so he sent me the advanced readers edition of Voice of the Heart in about 2000. And uh, so I read that thing and I'm one of those people I read it and I thought, man, this makes so much sense. I read the book one time. I haven't read it since. It made sense to me in 2000, about 2001, maybe. And so that point in time, Tom went on and I came out here, joined him and we worked together. The treatment center that he had begun in 1996, we did that together for 17, 18 years. And we just saw man after man after man and and women and their children uh, grow, grow their roots down deep into the soil of, of life based on dealing with these eight eight core feelings and opening back up those portals that have been closed off uh, mm -hmm. through trauma, woundedness and other things. And so the book came about from Chip's recognition of working with lots of people that something that was missing, what you might call classic therapy, was this whole idea around what happened in your story on an emotional level, not just the content. What, what's the emotional content yeah. of the story you live? And so that was the, the book came from that and lots of research that he did and synthesizing some things and some some original things from him that created the book. And so it's <laughs> it wasn't funny at the time. It's funny now looking back. He and I went to I won't name where it was, but we went to a place, made arrangements to go talk to someone about treating some of their folks in our treatment center. And we traveled for several hours in a car, stayed in a hotel that night, got up. And the guy we were there to see gave us about 10 minutes of time and then dismissed us. Like, okay, okay, thanks for coming. Goodbye. Mm. And so we spent 10 or 12 hours in a vehicle for about 10 or 15 minutes. So on the way back here to Nashville, I was just, I was just angry and scared and hurt. And uh, I said, you know what? I said, we, uh, we just need to do a Bible study, raise the flag on like their solid theology and these feelings like this, this is script. This is in the word of God here, feelings and having experiences with people. And we just need to do that. We just need to write a Bible study, go along with this thing and just let people know where we are. And Chip said, that is a great idea. Call Schulte. Y'all write that thing. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa. <laughs> and so that's literally the genesis of, of the Bible study. So Jeff, Jeff lived nearby. He lived in a little town called Anchorage, Alaska uh, at the time. <laughs> and so, so he and I were back before we had these, these platforms or that I knew about it. We were Skyping each other and his mouth would move. And, you know, three minutes later, the words would come and I was doing the same <laughs> thing. Yeah. And so he flew down here to the area three or four weekends and we just locked ourselves in our treatment center lecture room. We called it, we whiteboarded and we knocked that thing out. And, and uh, because to me, to him and many other people, like the theology is super clear it just wasn't overt in the book. And so Chip gave us one instruction. On, he has told people this publicly, as of Jeff and I. He said, listen, you guys do not write a Bible study for your seminary professors. Write mm -hmm. a Bible study for people who are living day in and day out, mm -hmm. dealing with these things, and they may not even know it. Write it for them. Yeah. And so that's what we, that's what we set out to do. That's kind of the, the, the creation of both of those works. I love that. Love it. You know, you're touching on something, Phil. It's, it's, it's a place where I want to take the conversation. Um, you, you talked about, hey, there's, I can hear your anger when you said it. There's theology in this. Like, this is all rooted in the life of God and the heart of God. Like, th this is not, this is not, our feelings are not what's wrong with us. They're part of our anthropology. Like, I can hear all of yes. that, you know, and uh -huh. there's something I've heard you say over and over again, and Jeff and, and Tin Man as well, and you talk about it in the book. It's just that this idea that feelings are the doorway into our needs and therefore the doorway into relationship and intimacy. And, um, you know, the problem, having said that, is that that's, that's not always the way that we're taught. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I got asked recently to speak at, uh, to speak to the students in our college ministry at church. And the topic was 
what's one thing I wish someone would have told me when I was your age? So I guess oh, being 40 now, I'm, I'm like considered the guy that can actually answer that question. You know, when I, <laughs> when I was your age, here's one thing I wish someone would have told me. And our mutual friend, Chuck Geschwin, was actually staying with me here in central Arkansas that, that, uh. Uh, for that couple of days that week. So he, I said, Chuck, you're going to teach with me. We're going to teach the college students. And I, I said, here's the topic. And so we both kind of prayed and, and thought, and we both came up with uh, together. Like, I wish, of all the things I wish someone would have told me, there's a lot of things. I wish someone would have told me that feelings are not what's wrong with me. Feelings are places to meet with God. You know, yeah, boy. Feelings are, are, are doorways into relationship. And um, having said that, that's not really the way most of us are taught, right? To approach our emotions. And uh, that's kind of the genesis of, of what created this, this, resor this resource that you guys made. And so here's, here's my question. In the book, you talk about that as the voice of convention. You know, you say, here's the voice of your heart. Uh, you know, let's take sadness, for example. And then you go into the voice of convention, which is how you've been taught to deal with your sadness or whatever the emotion mm -hmm. is. So, mm -hmm. Phil, how would you sum up what the voice of, con of convention is that most of us growing up here in the West have heard and experienced when it comes to our emotions? How, how are we pretty much taught to deal with our emotions? Yeah, I'll coattail off a statement that Dallas Willard made popular years ago, and it's sin management. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of Christian families, super well-intended parents, in some many cases, see feelings as being your your statement, Adam, is really beautiful. Like my feelings are not what is wrong with me; mm -hmm. they are how I relate to God and to self and to others. Yeah. And so, and they're scary. They're vulnerable. They are literally the language of vulnerability. You look mm -hmm. at any of those eight and like when I, when I confess I'm feeling one or more of those, I'm in a really vulnerable place. That's right. And so perhaps unwittingly, really good people can raise children and they say feelings are bad. And so the way you manage sin and the way you act right outwardly is to make those things go away because they get you in trouble. They do this, they do that. They, they are a sign of not having faith. And so perhaps in the, for the purpose of creating really good compliant children, parents will, the voice of convention will say, if you have those, do away with them because they can't be trusted. And the way you live successfully is don't sin outwardly, be nice, be cordial. And those are important things to be and that way, if you won't have those feelings, you can manage your sin and behave well. And that's mm. the point. That's the that's mm. what the voice of convention often says. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, what about you? Because I know, uh, you know, you know, you, you're, you've been in pastoral ministry for 20 years. What, how were you taught explicitly or implicitly by, you know, family of origin, culture, church to to approach? Yeah. Your explicitly, I wasn't taught. Implicitly, I was taught to ignore them or set them aside because we're intellectual or we just don't express emotions. I yeah. uh, grew up first generation Korean household, firstborn son of immigrants. And it's like there's so much trauma that that already carries. Mm -hmm. And then growing up in a pastor's house and being the firstborn oldest son of the pastor oh. and in the family and setting the example for everyone else. So it's just like. And being an Enneagram one on top of all of that, there's a whole range of emotions that I'm not allowed or supposed to show because they would be wrong, mm -hmm. right? So I don't get to express being hurt or lonely or sad or angry or ashamed or any of those things. Um, and then growing up or leading in or working in churches who have a theology of toxic positivity, right? Okay. Where you're only supposed to claim the victory or have healing or have any of those things to express grief or fear or hurt yeah. or yeah. loneliness or any of those things would be viewed as not spiritual enough mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so for me i think the first introduction to emotions came through counseling um, through books like untangling emotions or voice of the heart or any of these things like mm -hmm. oh emotions like you're saying are a pathway to god they're an invitation to something it's a sign that something is wrong or something is going on so tune into that figure out what it means and for me it was i was introduced to that whole feelings wheel thing 
which can be a really helpful tool for some. For me, it was just utterly overwhelming. <laughs> it's yeah. just too much. So look at that. It's like I have to feel yeah. like there's too many words on here. So when I got introduced to the voice of the heart, I was like, oh, eight feelings? I can do eight. I can narrow that. <laughs> um, and it was so much more instantly helpful to me. Um, and Phil, like you're saying, it's just, it makes so much sense. And there is so much good theological background and underpinning to the whole thing um, that that just, it really turned things around for me, like in the last two years, mm -hmm. I'd say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Man. glad to hear that. that. That really is true. It, you move so often, Brian, I've heard that story so often. You move from have nothing to do with these to look on this wheel of these 77 words and pick one. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Wow. That's like flooding. It's whiplash. <laughs> uh -huh. It really is. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. I mean, my, my story is really similar. And as, as I listen to both of you talk, um, I mean, I, I think what I'm picking up on is there's there's a few basic ways, toxic ways that we are taught to deal with our emotions. Um, both of you, both of you picked up on all three of them. But one is that we, you know, we demonize or shame our feelings. This can be explicit or implicitly taught to us as well, right? Some of us, this is explicitly taught. Uh, don't don't be a baby. I'll give you something to cry about. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Don't be weak. Um, and both of you said it too. There's even a spiritual version of this, you know. So you know, now all of a sudden my fear, and I'm an Enneagram six, right? So I have a close relationship with fear. Uh, I was taught most of my life that my fear was the opposite of faith, that mm -hmm. if I'm afraid, mm -hmm. it's, it's precisely because I'm not trusting God. So now, I, now I'm loaded down with shame um, because I'm afraid and I'm not, I'm not man enough uh, according to the culture and I'm not spiritual enough according to the church. So I don't trust God enough. Um, or, or sadness, you know, what do you have to be sad about? Cheer up. Jesus is alive. So, you know, we want to do the thing where we bypass Friday and Saturday and just skip to Sunday and be like, Hey, look, man, everything's okay. Um, so that's, that's shaming our feelings. Um, the other one is, is diminishing or minimizing our feelings. So it's this idea of, mm -hmm. Hey, look on the bright side. Things could always be worse. Um, you see this with comparison a lot, right? And other people, in fact, my wife called me out for this last night. So as wherever you are in time and space, as you're tuning into this episode, we were recording it uh, in late June, 2023, and I'm in central Arkansas and the heat index yesterday was 107. Uh, and our, our AC unit went out. So literally <laughs> as I'm recording this, I can hear guys beating on stuff outside because they're here and they're working on it. And I'm, I've got tons of fear about the, the bill of what that's going to cost. So last night I was, I was expressing myself honestly of I'm, I'm afraid, I'm angry, uh, you know, and I was expressing these things. And then I kind of came back around and shamed myself with this comparison of, man, things could be so much worse. Other people in our church have it so much worse. I need to grow up. I need to have, you know, I need to have more faith. And my wife just kind of stops me and she was like, Hey, there's an appropriate way to look around and have some perspective and be grateful that things are not as bad, that things could be worse. But like what you just did was spiritually abuse yourself. <laughs> and she, <laughs> just, she, just, she just sort of called me out, you know? Um, and so then I had a little bit of healthy dose of healthy shame and I felt right sized a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But my point is that's, that's one of the, one of the ways we're taught is just minimizing, comparing, and then the last one that I heard both of you pick up on, which is essentially just distracting, you know, so medicating ourselves. So whatever you got to do to avoid it, to stay out of your chest, stay out of your body, don't feel, stay busy, you know, and, and we'll use anything to, to numb. But I think, I really think those are the primary strategies handed to us by either your family of origin, culture, and sadly, even the church kind of hands those tends to hand those strategies to us and says, here's how you deal with your feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's super clear. Um, super, super clear and helpful. I think for people as they kind of examine their own relationship to their emotions, do you tend to demonize them, diminish them or distract from them? Um, yeah. 
And the problem with all three of those is it goes against our fundamental anthropology, the way that we're built and put together, right? And the truth is that our feelings or emotions are absolutely an essential part of who we are and what it means to be human, right? So books and resources like Voice of the Heart, for me, it was like Untangling Emotions by Alistair Groves, Emotionally Healthy, yeah. Spirituality and Discipleship. You hear that a lot from Pete Scazzaro. Yeah. They help us to see how our emotions are deeply a part of who we are. Yeah. And if we look at the Enneagram, we recognize that the nine types are each dominant in one of the three centers of intelligence, twos, threes, and fours in the heart or feeling center, five, six, and sevens in the head or thinking center, eights, nines, and ones in the body or doing center. Mm -hmm. And then you have the stances which show us where we are the most repressed in our thinking, feeling, or doing. So it can be really helpful to know through our centers of intelligence and our stances that we all tend to overdo or underdo in one of those three mm. areas. Mm. And that we have access to all three of those centers, whether we recognize it or not. Yeah, so, so Phil, for you, the question is, what would you say or would you say more about what it means that humans by definition are emotional beings? And maybe would you help us tease out, do you recognize a difference between emotions and feelings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you're hitting on something obviously very very powerful in how humans are made brian said so, you know we're so you know i don't know any parent who's ever had to send their little baby to a seminar on how to express yourself limbically first <laughs> <laughs> they, we are that is anecdotally evident I think the world has like 7 billion people. There are 7 billion points of data to suggest that a child, no matter where their child is born, comes out a really apparent limbic creature. You know, yeah. they, and you talk about, the, you know, the, the body to that. So as a man, I'm tied into that. But, you know, the, the original cry out uh, of little bitty babies is so body, can they cry out limbically, emotionally, uh, because they're wet or they're cold or they're hot or they're hungry or they're thirsty or they're dirty. <laughs> they they mm. pay attention to their bodies and they cry out given from that. And so children, you don't have to train a child when she doesn't get invited to the sleepover, but everybody else in the class did that. Mm. She's going to cry about that. And everyone got a Valentine except for me. And they may not know the words sad or hurt, but they will come home and their bodies and their words and their tears will say, I'm a limbic creature. The content, oh, he didn't know I was on the list or they, they thought I lived across town and wouldn't want to come. None of, the, none of that content stuff matters because we are limbic creatures primarily. We, we relate to other human beings and to God and with even their own identities through that limbic part of our brains, that right brain that says this is where the story lives. The real story lives here. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, Brian, you mentioned earlier your first generation of an immigrant, you, you will have a different experience internally when you see something about Korea on TV or whatever, then I will. And I will have those same different feelings about the state of Mississippi, which is my native state, just because we're limbic creatures. Mm. I, I, I mm. care about your story and where you're from, and you care about my story where I'm from, but we don't have the same internal experiences when we're moving into that story. Yeah, And so you don't need all the content around Korea to have feelings about your own heritage. And mm. so something, what we would consider to be simple like that, uh, we are limbic creatures. Our first responses to life are limbic. We have feelings about things and memories and lots and lots of people who know a lot more about brain chemistry than I do say, you know, even our senses run through this thing in our brain called the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that, that lets us know what's really going on in the world emotionally. And so yeah. when to take cover. So we, th this idea around how, how we are wired primarily, as you even watch children develop, just simple observations as children develop, obviously, physically first, with the brain stem as they're growing in utero. And then when they come out of, of, of that birth canal, they are limbic creatures. They are, they are crying out and using a language of right brain immediately. And so we in the voice of convention so often teaches them how that's not okay. 
Yeah. And which is where the, where the problems come in. And so we're just by simple observation, how humans are made from their earliest days says, oh, wow, these, these humans are limbic creatures. They reach and grasp and desire life. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, Phil, two things you've said that I want to, I want to piggyback on. One is you said, you know, the facts or the content, you know, the fact may be that they thought this kid you know, lived across town or whatever. And so that the, whatever, the kid didn't get the invitation because the, the facts were, were skewed or whatever, but those facts actually don't change the fact that the kid has the fact of the kid's feelings. And so we, we see this, you know, I've got three little girls <clears throat> when they were younger, um, you know, they would be scared of like the boogeyman or something in their bedroom or whatever. So they would call in their fear. They would call out to me in the night, which is a perfect example, actually an illustration of, how our feelings are the doorway into relationship because mm -hmm. her in her fear, she calls, she, she expresses her need for refuge mm -hmm. and her need for her father. And she calls out to me. And so it's like a magnet to my heart. I come running, right. I, I'm, I'm here for you, baby. I got you, you know? Uh, so there's intimacy through because she walked through her fears. Mm -hmm. But what I learned was I, I was unintentionally shaming them because I would come in their room, give them a hug and a kiss and a drink of water. But then I would turn on the lights and give them all the facts about how there's no such thing as a boogeyman. Look under the bed with me. I want you to look under here. There's no, and I would kind of give them all the truth and all the facts and tell them to go back to bed. And then the next time they called out to me, I would be angry. <laughs> look, I already fixed this for you. I gave you the, all the facts that you need, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that they're, that they're afraid. Right. So I, and yeah. I think that's, that's speaking to that, that reality you're picking up on that, that we are first and foremost limbic creatures. Like we actually come out of the womb experiencing life emotionally way before the cognitive stuff ever comes online. Right. Yes. Um, and, and so I think it was Kurt Thompson in, in, in the soul of desire who, if I could paraphrase him, I actually have the full quote in front of me because I, I, I pulled it up for this episode in case, in case I had, a, I was looking for a way to work it in. <laughs> um, but to paraphrase him, he says, if our brain is the engine, emotions are the gas. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he goes on and here, here's the full quote. He says, although researchers have not developed consensus on how to characterize it, they do agree to emotion being the energy around which the brain organizes itself. So emotions are the energy around which the brain organizes itself. When we examine human behavior, we find that if we take emotion out of the equation, we stop moving. Mm -hmm. the, the, the derivation of the word emotion includes its Latin root, a motion, which means to precede movement. This suggests that whatever emotion is, it, it, it energizes and gives rise to human movement. From the time we are born, emotion is a primary driving force of our existence. If attention is the ignition uh, of the mind, then emotion is the fuel in the tank that the engine runs on. Mm -hmm. Developmentally, emotion is present and active even before birth. Hence, mm -hmm. emotion is of primal significance when it comes to our doing anything. Phil, you want to piggyback? Man. I mean, do you have, does, that, does that stir up anything in you? It, it does, Adam. I love that quote, and I love that book, and I love his work. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a tiny, this rabbit trail is only about five yards long, but I, I love even, even to go along what you just said, they called their groups, confessional communities. Yes. Yeah. I thought, what a, what a beautiful way, you know, that the word homo legaos means to say the same thing, which is where we get our, you know, confession is agreement with God. So to think about even that word that we're going to sit in this group, we're going to say the same thing. And what is the same thing? Those eight words. You know, I, I love how that how he ties all that together. But yes, it does move me, and, and, and it really takes me back, Adam, to part of what you said about your your daughters. What you missed, and what I have missed, what a lot of humans miss is those girls were already being comforted with the knowledge you were coming, and so mm -hmm. everything we do after we get to the room is just superfluous. So like, hey, Dad. I, even if there is a dragon under the bed, you're here. So I'm not, I'm not afraid because you're yes. with me. And, oh. and we, uh, I too have done the bomb scan under the bed. See Luke, my son's name is Luke. <laughs> See Luke, no monsters. And he's, he's forgotten the monsters because dad's in the room. 
And, and again, right. that limbic territory said that's where attachment is made. And so like I make attachments with people that are coming to provide refuge and we parents can often forget my child is afraid in the dark. My child's afraid in the dark alone. And so oh. when they hear daddy or mommy coming, they go, I'm going to be okay. I'm being attended to. I'm being attuned with. And even if there is a monster, so what? I, I, I tell this. I, I had to go to defensive driving when I lived in Texas because of the narrow mindedness of the highway patrol in Texas. Uh, they wrote me a ticket for going over the speed limit and I was in a hurry. So I don't understand. So uh, I, I'm in this, I'm in this defensive driving class and the, and the DPS officer walks in, you know, those guys all look like they're eight feet tall and you know this broad and guy walks in and he goes, y'all need to know before we start the class that uh, the state of Texas leads the nation in railroad uh, locomotive to vehicle, not one instance did the train leave the track to hit the car. But stop at railroad crossings. <laughs> now let's continue. And by the and in the same vein, it's like there's not one recorded incident in humankind to where a monster came out from under a bed if mom or dad were in the room. <laughs> it's hmm. never happened. And so they crawl out from everywhere when mom and dad aren't there, but once, once mom and dad are in the room or they know they're coming, there comes that limbic experience of attachment. The cry out is being answered. Yeah. And so yeah. to, to that, the energy that brings up in me, in my, even in my body, Adam is like, yes, one more picture of how the cry out being answered builds faith. Your daughters did not build their faith by being not afraid your daughters yeah. built their faith by being afraid, crying out in their fear and being attended to. Mm -hmm. So, yes. so often we get yes. the message that fear and faith can't coexist and that could not be any less true. And that yeah. story you told that most parents have the experience of being called to a room at night, that their, their faith builds when daddy or mommy show up. Their faith yeah. builds by speaking their fear, not ignoring it oh. and shaming themselves That's beautiful. afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's so good. You know, on that note, let's talk about the eight feelings because, you know, you, you, you've mentioned this a couple of times, Phil, that the cry out of the feeling is, is around, you know, leads to some kind of relational need being met. Right. So if I'm afraid, I need I need the presence of a refuge. I need a safe place. You know, I need a protector. But I can't get that need met unless I'm willing to walk through my fear and tell the truth about it. Right. Yes. So can, can you just I know I know your, you know, your book, the uh, Voice of the Heart Bible Study and, and Chip's book um, are is kind of built around these eight feelings, which we would say there's a lot more than eight. But these are like primary colors. Right. So all the other feelings sort of find their home in these eight. But could you could you briefly just explain what the eight feelings are? Maybe give us a little definition and and. I would love it if you if you if you can share about the need or the gift of walking through those those feelings. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important, <clears throat> um, Adam, uh, Brian, to to say, first of all, that we will often hear the phrase, hey, hey, Brian, you, you need to deal with your fear. Hey, Adam, you need to resolve your anger or whatever. And so we go, OK, mm -hmm. and if I'm Brian, I'm going, OK, mm -hmm. wow, that's lightning thunder. Hope y'all didn't uh -oh. hear that. That was loud. Goodness. I saw that. <laughs> I did. Goodness. I did. Wow. Um, oh, oh, that's all fear, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> goodness sake. There you, there you saw it. Um, but we will hear those phrases. And if I'm Brian or Adam and I hear those phrases, I'm going, okay, what, how do, what does it mean to deal with these things? What right. does that even mean? And so before we move into the eight, it's super simple. If people would remember the, the initials I, E, E, and the first step is identify, which is why we pound away at know these feelings. So identify what is going on. We explore it. What is this about? And then we express it to someone safe. Mm -hmm. And so we'll go back to your, your daughters, Adam. Like they identified, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm afraid. And so they, they explored it. I'm afraid there's something in the room. I'm afraid there's something hiding in the closet. And they expressed that. Dad, mom. And so that's an example of that. So when we say, how do we deal with these feelings? That's what we're talking about. Hmm. That's the importance of sitting with another person that's safe to say that I'm feeling this and I think it's about such and such and so and so. So 
Love it. We'll start with a with a famous one. Let everyone wants to talk about anger, and and first of all, I am I am not a proponent. I'm actually an opponent of anger management, and here's the reason why. Um, anger is the feeling that lets me know that I care and what I care about. Really? It produces movement and clarity. When I'm angry, I'm angry about something that matters to me. And I move towards something with great clarity. It doesn't mean I'm going to get it my way. It doesn't mean it's going to change to suit me, but it means I want it. Mm. And when it's not happening, I'm angry about it. Injustice, people being mistreated my son being left off the team or my wife and I getting in, in a conflict where she's, of course she's wrong naturally, of course. And, <laughs> you know, and, and I need that. To, I want that to change. I hope she doesn't listen to this, uh, but you know, so anger just says, I want something to be different. And so the feeling itself isn't necessarily tied uh, to what we would consider to be accurate data, but it means I'm feeling it. I care about this and this is what I care about. I'm moving toward doing something with it. And mm -hmm. so if I'm angry with my friend Adam or my friend Brian, I'm going to move toward them, not with my arms extended to choke them, but I'm going to move toward them and say, <laughs> I'm willing to, I, you matter to me. This relationship matters to me. What I'm angry about matters to me. And I want to move into you and I'm asking you to move into me and let's deal with this. Let's identify it, explore it and express it to one another. Mm -hmm. and so that's why I don't want my anger managed. I want my anger identified, explored and expressed. And so the mm -hmm. gift that comes out of as I do that, I receive this gift called passion, which means pain. It's painful to care. It's painful for something to matter. That's what's so attractive about depression or, or apathy. It's like it's, it's so much less painful to not care. Mm. And anger says, I'm too angry. Mm. I have a chip and a chip would say to me once in a while, like, I think I'm depressed. I would go, you're not depressed. You're too angry to be depressed. No, no one is angry. <laughs> you can help me depressed. You know, it's like, and I really meant it. Like this man is so full of passion. And so it's like, okay, anger says I'm moving towards something and it's painful. And there's a need that gets exposed to that call. I, I need voice. I need a relationship in which I can be heard about mm. what I'm after. Mm. It doesn't mean I'm going to get it. It means I need to be heard in my want of it. So words like mm. wanting, desiring, reaching, yearning, yeah. those are words of anger. Love it. Love so it. Oh, that's really helpful. Think, think about the anger of Jesus. Like, you talk yeah. about life and people mattering ultimately as, as God incarnate it mattered to him. Yeah. We matter yeah. to him. Yeah. Um, so uh, the second uh, one, I guess we talk about, might as well talk about fear. Let's, let's go to the big two first. Let's, let's talk about a lot in church. We've talked a lot, Adam, using the example of your, of your daughters, but fear just simply says I could be in danger. And fear is, is yes, it's the beginning of wisdom because I recognize who God is and I recognize who I am. Yes, that is a fear like Job, like Isaiah, who saw God and said, oh, I get it. I see. There's all, and then the, 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 feet, the boots on the ground idea around fear is I want to be alert. I want to watch and see if I'm in trouble. That, so mm -hmm. I, I tell this half jokingly, pastors who say faith and fear cannot coexist, do not be afraid. They need to stop studying then for sermons. Yeah. Because every time a pastor studies for a sermon, he's listening to healthy fear that says, I fear if I don't study, I will teach God's word inaccurately. Or I'll right. tell people information that's not true. And so I want my pastor to have healthy fear so he can study God's word. And when I'm teaching it, to study God's word and to teach people accurately and truthfully what it says. And so healthy fear says, that's my my reach for a thing called discernment and wisdom, which is the gift of it. Like when I'm mm. fear is what drives me to ask good questions. Hey, I'm not sure about this. But t tell me more. I need to know more about this because I, I, I feel fear, though I wouldn't say it that way. I feel fear. I'm getting myself into something I may be sorry for later. So tell me more. I, I need to know more about this. And so every time we study, every time a team practices, every time a choir practices or an acting group rehearses for a play, they're listening to healthy fear to prepare themselves. So if you put those two feelings together, fear prepares us for battle. Anger takes us to it. 
Mm. And so mm. I want to have mm. the wisdom and discernment of being afraid. So I prepare well, then I want to go do it. I want to go get after it. Yeah. And so this need and, and my fear, my need is like, I need refuge and I need safety. I need to, yeah. and so the children afraid in, the, in bed in the dark are saying, I need, where can I sail this ship that's in choppy, scary waters where I know I'm safe for refuge? Yeah. Phil, it might have been you that I heard say one time in a cohort that I don't I would never want to go to war with people who are not afraid. Yes. Because if they're not afraid, they're not gonna they're gonna they're not gonna prepare. And yes. they're not gonna have they're gonna be wise and they're not gonna be careful and they're gonna get out there and get somebody killed or get themselves killed. So I love that I love that idea of the re, the reality of of fear gives leads to the 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 need to for safety and and it, and it leads to the gift of being prepared and and and, and mm-hmm. wisdom. Oh yeah, thanks for sharing yeah, that. For sure, yes. Sadness is another one. I I, I have two acquaintances. Uh, one one was very close to his dad, and they were actually together. And the dad died suddenly of a massive heart attack. Mm. And the mutual friend of the son, whose dad died, I asked how he was doing. How's Joe? Not his real name, but how's Joe doing? And my friend said, "This is about a week later." He goes, "Oh man, he's just moving on. He just knows his dad's." in heaven with the Lord and he's doing great. And about that time, my son Luke was walking up the stairs and I couldn't help myself. I said, I'll tell you something. I hope his grief lasts longer than a week when I die. Like that, that was horrifying to me. Mm. So sadness is that feeling that we have that says this life mattered to me. It Mm. mattered. And I'm having these tears Mm. and this sadness in me. So sadness leads to a condition called grief, and the and the outlet of that grief is called lament. Uh, we lament. I've I've taken to saying that we grieve nouns. We we grieve people, places, and things. We grieve the loss of dreams. We grieve the loss of place. We grieve the loss of relationships with people and pets and those kinds of things. So we 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 are made the most universal experience of mankind is the experience of loss. Mm. And here's something very important, guys. That the writer of Ecclesiastes says this to us. If we're listening and reading well, we'll hear it. We'll see it. Here's what we intuitively know with eternity placed in our hearts. We intuitively know that every human relationship on earth ends painfully. Every mm-hmm. one of them. I can have the greatest relationship in the world with my wife. And at some point, death is going to part us. My friend's going to move away. Someone's going to drift away from me. They don't want to be my friend. We just get busy and like every relationship ends, ends very painfully on earth. Therefore, if I'm unwilling to be sad, I will not attach. So mm. sadness and attachment are inextricably linked because the, wow. we, we stand and look at our wives and say, till death do us part. I will not leave you nor forsake you on a human level till death do us part. Something inside a bride and a groom says, mm, this matters. I'm doing something of great gravity. It's not the rings. It's not the sign of the covenant. It's those words till death do us part forsaking all others. Mm. So that, that speaks to eternity in our hearts. It says, I'm going to, I am signing up for sadness. I will be dying Mm. and you'll, I'll be looking in your eyes. You'll be dying. I'll be looking in your eyes or something. I'll get the phone call that you're not here anymore or you will. But at some point when this ends, it's going to, it's going to be very painful. And I'll be so sad. And I'm willing to do it. So sadness says, I have suffered loss and it mattered. Mm. And the and the gift I get is a thing called acceptance. And I remember Chip telling me this one time, uh, like when the way we taught it, he said, I really think that acceptance is probably it's not okay and it's okay. There are going to be times that it's just not okay. And overall, it's okay because in my humanness and in my walk with Christ, I've recognized that the great interrupter interrupts. Mm-hmm. And it isn't okay, and it is. And so, the what I what I'm looking for in that need of sadness is a need for comfort. And the word comfort, actually, the closer word to comfort would be the word strengthen. It means to fortify through pre- comfort. Means to fortify through presence. And so, when mm-hmm. I'm comforted by a friend, that's what's so powerful about the the phrase you hear, non anxious presence. When my friend Brian or my friend Adam sits with me in my grief, and they're just sitting with me. And they're just saying, I'm with you there. You, you guys would be 
fortifying my, but through your presence, fortifying my ability to stay in my feelings where I am. So grief can do its work. Hmm. Like hmm. the Aaron and her holding up Moses's arms, like we three guys, two of us hold up the other guy's arms to fortify that man and the comfort that he needs because he's exhausted in his sadness. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so loneliness, good. loneliness speaks to how we're made as humans. We, we spent the first several minutes talking about attachment and limbic experiences and those things. Loneliness says I need relationship really lonely. And I won't, I won't go far into this for time's sake, but one of the reasons we didn't think uh, that uh, Tom Hanks's character in Castaway was insane because he wanted to leave a perfect environment to get back to Memphis. The reason we didn't think that guy was crazy is because we knew that the people he loved were in Memphis and I would fight tooth and nail wherever my family was to get back to them. And so him being on a tropical Island where he had no hassles, no traffic, no boss, perfect weather. He, he risked his life and he got a relationship with a volleyball. And I like millions of other people freaked out. I even said this one time, man, I freaked out when Wilson jumped off that raft. My wife is like, it's a volleyball. He didn't jump. It ain't even. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Well, I was so much in the movie because we're relational creatures. Like, heck, yes, I get a relationship with a volleyball. Yeah, for sure. His name's right on the front, right, Wilson? And so, you know, we went to that movie, and the movie made sense to us. We were rooting for him to get back home because we know loneliness. I'm mm. made for relationship, for intimacy, which is the gift of loneliness. In to be see, I'm made to connect deeply with other people. And when I don't have it, I'm lonely for it. And that un uncovers this need to be known. I, I mm. need to be known relationally. The loneliness mm. is a very, very human feeling. Then hurt, hurt is a, <clears throat> by definition, hurt is woundedness. And just like if you were to cut your leg, your brain would get really busy marshalling forces to tend to that cut on your leg. It does the same thing for emotional hurt, which you notice guys, the euphemisms we use to describe emotional hurt, slap in the face, punch in the gut, broke my heart, stabbed in the back. Well, when scientists discovered ways of reading the brain in real time, they discovered that emotional hurt and physical hurt were processed in exactly the same spot. Wow. So, uh, so a guy named David in Psalm 139 said, you know what? We're fearfully, wonderfully made. It's just really mysterious and crazy how God has knit us together. And our own, even our language was telling us we were experiencing emotional hurt that's hooked in with our bodies in our brains in exactly the same spot. Mm. And so that, that's remarkable. I've experienced some woundedness because I got a gash on my leg, woundedness because I have a gash in my heart. My heart is broken or my leg is broken. That's one of the reasons, by the way, that opioid addiction operates when my bones are hurting and when my heart is broken. Wow. People will often get hooked on opioids because wow. it addresses hurt. Yeah. So wow. people will, we will help people deal with emotion or hurt. The opioid ep epidemic will get a, a dent in it because people are taking opioids to anesthetize hurt, but not a mm. bone heart. And so that, wow. that need for loneliness and to be known, I've heard that is the need for attention. And so when I feel hurt, when our kids are little, they run in the house and they show us, oh, show us the boo-boo. Give attention to me. I'm hurting. And when, when he's not, doesn't make the team or she's not invited to sleep over, they need atten atten attended to in heart. Give attention mm. to the hurt. You go into the ER, the doctor gives attention to what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. those, those kinds of ideas like so hurt needs attention mm -hmm. and then uh guilt guilt is is that really valuable feeling that says I've, I've done something to cause harm i've harmed mm -hmm. someone and that's not okay and guilt lets me know that i've done it and it's not okay mm -hmm. and so the gift of that is is called freedom it's like wow because here's what happens if i if i have sinned if i've caused harm to brian and Brian doesn't know it, but I know it. I'm in bondage to a secret. And then Adam is our friend too. And I go, gosh, I got to make sure because I don't know if Adam knows that I did this or not, but if those two have coffee, I'm going to be in trouble. So I'm going to be really working hard to make sure Adam and, and, and Brian never get together. Or if they do, I'm going to, and I'm going to make sure I'm managing Adam. So he doesn't say anything. It's just bondage. 
And so when I, when I make confession of my guilt, I'm free of the bondage and my need is forgiveness. So Brian's a human and I receive forgiveness of God, his promise, and the secret is out. I'm now known out of my loneliness and, and I'm free of the secret. It may take Brian longer to forgive me because he's human. Mm. And so that's where I say, okay, mm. I will wait. I will feel fear and maybe even hurt that Brian's not showing up and forgiving me yet. So even that has limbic experience with it. And so that guilt says, and, and then the need is for forgiveness. I need to be forgiven with guilt. Mm. And then shame, healthy shame. Our, our mutual friend, uh, Adam, Jeff Schulte, had a great word. He said, you know, shame is such a buzzword that, that he, had, he, he told me one time, he said, I've come to telling people healthy shame. Shame means unashamedness. I'm unashamed of my humanness. Mm. And so healthy shame simply says, I have limitation. Like I'm unashamed of my limitation. I may have feelings about it, but I'm unashamed of the fact that I need a lot of help. And so yeah. that's where the, the gift of humility comes in. Healthy shame's gift is humility. Like I tell the truth about my giftedness and I tell the truth about my limitations. Humility. Mm -hmm. You used a phrase earlier, Adam, right size. Mm. Like hu humility is just right size. Your wife confronted you. You're being grandiose and comparing and all that stuff. And you went, oh, yeah, I have a limitation. My air conditioner breaks down and I need someone to fix it. And I'm scared yeah. about what it's going to cost. And that's yeah. just the truth. Yeah. That right size, humility. Yeah. yeah. And then the one that, that we need to talk about, last one, what we need to talk about, uh, what it isn't first. So gladness. Everybody says, you guys have heard it. How come there's seven bad ones and one good one? <laughs> seven, yeah. seven negative ones and one positive one. Well, here's how that operates. If gladness is my goal, I will end up living chasing gladness, which actually means chasing sensual experience. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're stimulated as humans in four places, our brains, our bellies, our genitals, and our skin. So I will attempt, if I'm chasing gladness, I will attempt to learn enough to make myself okay, mm. eat enough, or restrict my eating enough. So belly's tied to both anorexia, bulimia, binging, purging, all those things, and overeating. And so I will use my belly stimulation by eating or not eating to make myself okay. Genitals, I can have enough sex or uh, act out enough sexually to make myself okay. And skin stimulation are thing we used to call them adrenaline junkies, things that make your your necks end up affairs, secrets, uh, those kinds of things, high risk behavior, excessive working out, things that keep me going, stimulation addiction. And so if I'm chasing gladness and gladness is my goal, then I'm going to end up living seeking stimulation. It's not true gladness. Yeah. True gladness is an outcome of living fully in those other seven feelings. Gladness is I'm human. I'm living in my humanness. I'm connected relationally in my humanness, and I'm glad. Like wow. this, the life, life. I'm living life as life is to be lived as God created me. And the gift of that is joy and sadness, because the sadness is back to Ecclesiastes. It hasn't always been this way, and it ain't gonna stay this way. It's sad. Yeah. And then the need of celebration. I'm, when I'm glad, I need people to share in the joy with me. People that I love to celebrate with me. And so that that's a blow through, but that's kind of an articulation of the list as the chart, as we call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Thank you. That is profound. Um, and I feel like your explanation on joy, just are you glad flips so much theology on its head <laughs> yeah. of what yeah, we're yeah. taught in churches or in Sunday school. Um, and I love just the way you explain how we pursue the wrong things or the, mm -hmm. the lesser things, right? Um, instead of finding the fulfillment and the fullness of all the other seven. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I just want to summarize the eight feelings and their gifts. Just so, you know, talking about feeling anger and living into it to discover the gift of passion, of feeling fear to find wisdom, feeling sadness to find acceptance, to find feeling lonely to find the gift of intimacy, feel hurt to receive healing, feeling guilt to receive freedom and forgiveness, feel shame to find humility, and glad to find a joy with sadness. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I love what you said at the very beginning of how do we deal with these feelings to process them and just to remind everyone, IEE, you want to identify what's going on, name the feeling, explore what it's about, where it's coming from, and then express it to someone safe. And I mm. think that expression and that community building is so much of where that safety comes from. Um, and like you're saying, that intimacy part. Um, mm. Man, that's just so helpful. Bill, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and before we go, we want to kind of tie it a little more to the Enneagram and talk about how it helps us to explore and connect with those feelings. So, Bill, you're, you're a type nine. You're in that body and doing center. Um, you and I both primarily re <laughs> express anger and feel that, right? So for you, how do you discover that your relationship to these feelings and your expression as a nine affects those experience of those emotions well you know brian i think you would agree nine is kind of the perfect number to you know the kind of <laughs> so I, I, the, the perfection is tough to deal with but no. uh gosh I wish someone's got to carry it somebody's got to do it uh, <laughs> uh, you know I, I i connect deeply the first time i read about enneagram i connected deeply that idea around harmonizing being, you know, kind of being a harmonizer, wanting things to work a certain way and really getting the clinical term, just really getting dysregulated when it wasn't, when something mm -hmm. wasn't harmonious. And y'all certainly far more knowledgeable than I am around that, around the Enneagram. But uh, my, my layman's take was I get really dysregulated when anything is in any kind of disharmony. I really uh, get rattled around all that. So I find myself having to really consistently and, and I learned this fairly late in my career, the last decade or so, the importance of me paying very close attention to, to the B-O-D-Y, pay attention to my body, mm -hmm. what is happening here? Uh, because, man, I had for years and years, I had GI stuff, sour stomach, like all those things. And I went to every doctor in the world and, you know, there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough Pepsid to knock down to knock down what was going on in my body when 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 things were in disharmony, which is kind of how the world works, disharmony. So I find even in my in my work to be very careful to, to start looking out for, do I try to get really, really busy in solving something or mm. do I find myself really rattled and having these physiological things come up, even sitting here in this chair working with people. So. I find that that some sometimes my desire for harmony becomes a demand. Mm. And I get really triggered around demanding that things be this way so I don't have to be afraid. Yeah. Wow. 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 Yeah, I love that, Phil. It's you know, my, my wife's a type nine, so I'm gonna make sure she listens to this uh episode and <laughs> learns learn something uh from you there um it's been so good to be with you phil and i, I you know i, I just want to say um to our listeners you know the, the real gift of the enneagram uh in, in exploring your emotional world is the enneagram this is why our, our mental health professional friends love this tool is it really yeah. is pulling you in but beneath the hood of consciousness into the space of emotions and the emotional processes or we might say core motivations that are driving us. And it goes back to that Kurt Thompson line earlier. Look, nobody does anything if not motivated by emotions. Like it's, it, you know, there it's the gas in the tank, right? Yes. That moves us. And so the Enneagram is helping you explore that world. It's, it's not, it's not pulling you out of the left brain, but it's, it's helping you get an integration. So mm -hmm. I think the, I think the, the, the word of application for all our listeners is regardless of your type, Pay attention to how emotions are showing up according to your type and pay attention to how your type is showing up to your emotions. Mm. Um, every yeah. type has a unique expression to their emotions. You know, ones, eights and nines might access their anger a little easier than other types, although nines may want to soften the term and call it frustration. Um, fours might have a closer relationship to their sadness than, say, a type seven might. Fears obviously have a closer relationship or sixes fears. I just called six as fears. <laughs> so there's there's a Freudian slip for you. Uh, so sixes have a closer relationship to fear, and and we could obviously walk the wheel. But I think I think pay attention to how how your emotions are showing up according to your type, 
uh, and let the Enneagram help you experience how your type is showing up to your emotions. And I think coming back to Phil's three things, regardless of your type, what's healthy and human is to identify what you're feeling, explore what you're feeling and express what you're feeling to someone safe. That's the pathway to deeper relationship. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Phil, this has been so insightful. Thank you so much for coming on, giving us a better understanding of how our feelings are tied to our bodies, right? They're not something separate that happens and how Mm -hmm. even what we commonly perceive as negative or bad emotions actually offers really beautiful invitations and gifts. Mm -hmm. Um, And how the Enneagram helps us to see why and how we feel the way that we do. Mm -hmm. Um, So to everyone listening or watching, remember, if you're interested in learning more about the Enneagram, visit our website at yourenneagramcoach.com. And if you're ready to take it a step further with a personalized Enneagram coach, check out our incredible certified coaches and the directory at myenneagramcoach.com. For those of you who may want to bless others by becoming a certified coach, check out our leading certification program at yourenneagramcoach.com. Our team is here to guide you every step of the way and join us in blessing others with an accelerated transformation. Adam, you want to close us out? Absolutely. Phil, uh, last question. For anyone that might be interested in, in working with you or, or like with Tin Man, for example, uh, how, how, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, thank you. Website, tinmanministries.org, Tin Man like Wizard of Oz. Uh, minutes.org and we make a call. There's a form submission on the website. Uh, our, our friendly intake crew, which is Jordan, a guy named Jordan, will talk with you and get you matched up with someone. And we would love, love to serve in that way. Had a blast today, guys. Love it, man. Thanks, thanks so much for being, for being here. here. Phil. Thank, yeah, thanks, thanks Phil, it. Brian. Uh, next time, Brian and I are going to be talking about the Enneagram and healthy leadership. It's going to be a practical and insightful episode, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. And remember, the Enneagram reveals your need for Jesus, not your need to work harder. It is the gospel mm. that transforms us. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next episode.